Well, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Rowan Gray. I'm an assistant professor of law at the University of Willamette in Oregon. I'm also a director of Public Money Action, a 501c4 that promotes public education and, and tries to improve our public policy making process around money and financial issues. And I'm joined today for this very special one-on-one -on -one interview uh, with Philip Deal, the former director of the United States Mint, appointed by President Clinton, um, and currently president of US Money Reserve, to talk about this idea that's been um, you know, taking the world by storm and, and getting into the press about how we could potentially resolve uh, the ongoing and recurring debt ceiling crises that we've been experiencing uh, through uh, a provision of the uh, Coinage Act uh, that allows the minting and issuing of a uh, platinum uh, proof and bullion coins uh, of whatever denomination the, the, mint, uh, the Treasury Secretary determines to be appropriate. Um, so we're going to go into the de some detail about the history of that law and some of the sort of edges and boundaries of it. But before I get into that, I'd like to just you know, let everybody get to know you a bit more because you, you're the sort of architect behind this in many respects and, and uh, have a, had a pretty um, incredible and unusual career. So would you mind sort of telling us a little bit about, you know, what, what got you to be the director of the US Mint, where you were beforehand and, and, and what that journey was like? Um, well, I went to... Uh, to um... Washington DC when I was 39 years old. So I had a long career before that in uh, government, some in politics, but mostly in government and the private sector. Um, I went to Washington to be legislative director to Senator Lloyd Benson of Texas. And I served in that role until I'd be for almost two years until uh, he appointed me to be uh, majority staff director of the Senate Finance Committee. And I was probably the shortest lived director of uh, uh, Senate Finance because within three months, Bill Clinton was elected. A few weeks later, Senator Benson was chosen as Secretary of the Treasury. And then I went in as his Chief of Staff at the Treasury Department on the first day of the Clinton administration. I was in that job, a thankless job, <laughs> it was just, my kids never saw me. Uh, I had young kids at home. And after about six to nine months, I felt like I had helped the, the uh, sender, now secretary, transition into the job. And so I decided that I was ready to go home back to Austin, Texas. And he said, well, why don't you go look at the United States men? Uh, that's a turnaround situation. I know you want to run a company. And I had, I was never a collector. I didn't know hardly anything about the U.S. Mint, but you don't tell the Secretary of Treasury no. <laughs> so I went over there and I was very fortunate because a fellow by the name of David Ryder uh, was director at the time. And he was a Bush administ administration, H.W. Bush administration holdover. And he and I really made a connection. He gave me a great orientation to the U.S. Mint. So I went back to the secretary after three weeks and told him, yeah, I am interested. This looks like a, a real good opportunity. And that's a very unusual move for someone who came to Washington because of his policy interests. And uh, this really isn't a policy foundation. It's a manufacturing and marketing operation. And, but I saw it as a diamond in the, in the rough. And I thought I could do something with it. And one of the things really that animated me and animated the team around me at the U.S. Men is we had and have a very strong commitment to demonstrating what government, well-led government agencies can do for the American people, that there's a real role for an active government. And I really liked this particular audience that I was playing to, the US Mint customers on the bullion and numismatic side of the business, who are, you know, I used to say white male and over 50, conservative, Republican. And I said the white male over 50 thing was something I aspired to. Uh, <laughs> now I'm well into that, <laughs> that demographic. And, um, and I think we really had an impact on them, uh, surprising 
uh, and you know, surprising them in what we were able to accomplish in a whole lot of areas. Yeah, it's, in, it's incredible. You know, you would think that sometimes people come up through the ranks of the Mint or they come in, you know, thinking of their job just to keep the lights on and not make waves. But as you said, you came in thinking of it as almost a turnaround and you'd had experience both on the hill and then in, in the heart of Treasury and sort of seeing a bird's eye view and you saw what this agency could do and, how, and what it could become. And that not only a vision for active government, but a vision for how to take an agency and to make it bigger than what it might have been. And, History is full of people who've really kind of had a vision for making something bigger than, than what it was when they came in government and, and to be creative about that. So do you mind going into a bit more detail about what your sort of vision was for the Mint, what your agenda was? I know you were there for quite a while, but, you know, sort of looking back, what would you say your kind of priorities were or how, how do you feel your legacy of what you left the Mint, you know, what shape you left it in versus where it started? Um, I started, well what I thought was small, ended up being pretty big and with uh, three priorities that I, in my confirmation hearing, I called those out. And one of them was the financial uh, situation at the Mint, both performance and in terms of the whole financial structure was a terrible mess. And we were one of the first agencies because we had private sector-like functions. We were one of the first agencies subject to a new federal law that subjected government agencies to outside audits. And eventually that spread to every agency. And our first uh, audit, the US Mint failed. And for any number of reasons. So I said, we need to fix that. Uh, the second thing was um, we had a real problem with customer service to our numismatic customers, really all three of our customers, uh, bullion, numismatic, and then circulating coins with the Federal Reserve is the U.S. Mint's customer. And uh, I said we needed to fix that. That was a big problem with just performance uh, morale in the agency, tremendous criticism from outside the organization uh, because of that failure of performance. And then the third thing was there was there is this commemorative coin program in which the U.S. Mint produces upon a mandate of Congress a um, a, a commemorative a series of commemorative coins. And Congress mandates every one of those programs. And so, and this is a way of raising funds for organizations that have access to very powerful members of Congress. And uh, it's a way of circumventing the appropriations process. So there grew to be a feeding frenzy for these programs. And as a result, by the time I became director the market for these coins had collapsed because of abuse really by uh, Congress. And so that was getting that program under control was my third priority. And I could only do that with the help of members of Congress, especially a couple of committee chairs uh, to rein in that program. So that's really where I start, started, but we got increased as we built our capabilities and our confidence in our capabilities. And there's a psychological element to that. There's a personnel element, a personnel element to it. There's a structural element to it. There's a financial element to it. It's a presidential the, element. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so we, we, um, we grew in confidence and capability in what we could do, which ultimately led to a series of highly innovative entrepreneurial programs that we had Congress enact and that we built on to build our credibility and our capabilities. And the first one of those programs was the platform uh, Eagle program. And I wanted to, uh, first of all, I had built a, begun to build a relationship with a new Republican 
chairman of our, um, our banking committee, financial services committee, uh, oversight committee, subcommittee, Michael Castle from Delaware. And so I went to him and said, we, are, we have this idea for a brand new platinum coin that allows us to, will allow us if we restructure it correctly to compete in international markets. And we had never competed in international bullion markets before. And so I asked for a blank slate, completely unprecedented in US mint and US coinage, 200 years of US coinage history, where in the past Congress mandated every little detail uh, and the Mint could not deviate from those details, had no discretion. And I asked for virtually total discretion to design a coin based on market research and building a relationship with the person, the company and the patriarch of the company in Japan, which along with North America, the two big international platinum bullion markets. And so, that included everything from design to denomination. And that's what we were granted. I drafted that bill. He got behind it, carried it to fruition. It got embedded in a much larger coinage act uh, that was designed to fulfill one of my promises. And that was to get the commemorative coin program under control, to limit it. So that's relevant to the issue of um, the platinum coin because it has been described as our intent and Congress's intent to create another collectible. And that was not the intent. The intent was to authorize a bullion coin. And as a sidelight of that, it also uh, allowed us to produce a, a proof coin, which is a collectible coin. It was never intended to be a commemorative coin of any kind. So that's sort of how we got started. That program was immensely successful. Within six months of launching the, uh, the bullion version of this coin, we had taken 60, 65% of the Japanese market away from another competitor. And we had also, of course, taken the North American market away. And that success laid the groundwork for Congress to pass the 50 state quarters program. We demonstrated our ability to perform on an entrepreneurial project. So I want to just take a step back. I want to get into the coin, the platinum coin provision in particular. But two things that you mentioned were interesting to me. One is you were talking about the idea that Congress had previously micromanaged all of these different coin programs and you wanted more discretion. One of the things that I traced out in my research on this issue was that if you look at the debt ceiling, the original, before the debt ceiling existed, Congress would micromanage the issuance of treasury debt. You have to issue this amount of this kind of duration for this spending program and this amount for this program, et cetera. And in the earlier 20th century, that became increasingly unwieldy as the, as the government got bigger. And one of the goals of the original debt ceiling, if not the primary goal, was to give more discretion to the treasury to choose how to finance, right? You tell us how much to spend and we will work out how to do it. Um, in fact, I think it was Secretary Mellon in the 30s said, you know, we should have complete discretion using similar words to you in what kinds of securities we issue and what denominations to meet our needs, get Congress out of it entirely. Um, and it seems like there's that trend in general as the government gets bigger and more complicated to, to put more discretion onto the executive branch, not to make the important political decisions, but to, to execute on the sort of priorities and commitments. And it seems to me that's kind of consistent with that there's a sort of parallel there with you getting more of that discretion within the Mint's sort of authority, the way that the Bureau of Debt Management or, or Office of Debt Management would have done with Treasury Securities. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there's another element to this. And that is that Congress has delegated more authority to the executive branch as it has become more politicized over decades. 
Um, and a great example of that is the base closure commissions in which because it is so political, politicized in terms of who are the winners and losers that Congress in the past was paralyzed in its ability to make the Defense Department more uh, efficient by closing down bases that had outlived their usefulness. And so what did it do? It turned over to the executive branch a process by which it presented a package of bases to be closed and consolidated. And then that package went to Congress and they could vote it up or down. They could not amend that package whatsoever. So basically what Congress did was said, put these handcuffs on us and then, you know, and then just give us a simple option. That's also what they did with that whole commemorative coin program. I basically put together a base closure commission for these coins so that there was a committee that was formed that would make recommendations to Congress and congressmen would make recommendations to us, but they didn't have to say no. They could say, oh, the executive branch committee over here, they said no, sorry. Mm -hmm. And you can see a clear parallel with the debt ceiling today where everybody knows it needs to be increased or abolished, but nobody wants to take political responsibility. And so yes. for the executive branch to step into the breach and say, look, we're going to do what everybody knows needs to be done, but yes. maybe politically unpalatable. And yep. that might be to use authority that you've clearly given us, you know, in ways that yes. maybe you want to be able to say, hey, we didn't <laughs> want this. And yes. that's useful political theater because you can distance yourself a little bit, but it allows us to keep doing what needs to be done. And that is part of the magic of the trillion dollar coin is it takes, it depoliticizes the whole issue after you take bite the bullet or yeah. bite the coin and do it. It takes that issue out of the hands of Congress. Mm -hmm. Everybody is off the hook. And except, you know, the Secretary of Treasury and, and the President. And actually, I, I think what happens right now, what is happening is the trillion dollar coin and also the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. serve as a back, a fail safe yes. on, on the coin. Mm -hmm. So everybody can play games with the politics of this, knowing that in the end, that there are outs to this and to sort of settle markets down as they pretend to approach this disaster of the economic collapse of default. Um, and I, you know, I think that's part of what has happened this week when uh, all of a sudden, you know, Senator McConnell decides that uh, well, let's put this off because there were escape hatches. There were other things that were going on too, like, uh, you know, the Department of Defense intervened. In we, saying, we need to keep the lights on. This is a national yeah, security we need issue. To pay our people. Yeah. And so there were, there were other things at play too. But um, my, you know, the timing of the article that was written by Felix Salmon. Mm -hmm. that said, you know, the quoted me saying, oh, the, the Treasury Department- Could be done in hours. Yeah, can produce this coin overnight virtually if they set up a couple of docks in order. And that's the first time I don't think that had ever been said. No, it hadn't. And, and so, and it got tremendous play. Of course, as you know, Drudge put it at the top of their page and front page and then you <laughs> gave a, a spin to the title that suggested it was They're already, going to do it. <laughs> yeah. They're doing it right now. So the hyperbole which, helped bring it further into reality. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It certainly, it certainly blew up the whole story. Yeah, and I want to just go to take a step back also, you because we were just talking about, you know, taking this out, depoliticizing this. But of course, this isn't about depoliticizing the budget itself. This isn't about depoliticizing spending yeah. itself. That's yeah. still an incredibly political process. In fact, maybe the central political process yes. for Congress. This is just about 
honoring that spending once it's already been committed and not saying we're going to ignore Congress or we're going to go back on our debts and things. And, and I just want to sort of connect that because one other thing you, you haven't mentioned yet about your legacy, and correct me if I'm wrong about when this, the timing of this, but my understanding is you were also the Mint director when the Mint um, really sort of separated its own budget from the rest of Treasury and became a non-appropriated fund instrumentality, which means essentially that it funds itself through its own operations. You know, the CFPB does this with fines. Other agencies do this with fines. The Fed does it with its own money creation powers. But you essentially sort of elevated the mint back up to an equal status with the Fed in terms of being kind of off balance sheet from the rest of the government, which when you combine that with the mint's sort of internal powers makes it a very, very, you know, powerful institution. As you said, the mint has been around for 200 years. It's the oldest monetary institution in the US government. but that seems to have been a pretty key moment in in making the modern mint what it is today. Do you have? You know? Yes, it absolutely was. And when I proposed this to Treasury, I got laughed at. I said, mm -hmm. "How are you going to get Congress to let go of the purse strings on on your agency?" And I said, "I'm going to do the, do it through the Appropriations Committee," which made them laugh harder because, of course, the Appropriations Committee is where where that, that power is exercised. But I already knew at the time that the chairman of my appropriation subcommittee was going to back it because he and I had talked about it. And he really- you worked on the Hill. You know how this works. Uh, well, I, yes. And I, yes, exactly. But also I was very fortunate because the new Republican chairman of the committee, this was in 95. So right after the Gingrich revolution, um, the new Republican chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee was a conservative, very conservative Republican. But he and I hit it off on a personal level. And he really liked the idea of what I was doing at the United States Mint, of turning it into a, an entrepreneurial, you know, business-like uh, agency. Believing and the I, government can do something, ironically. Yes, yes. This was before that there was this commitment on in the party, his party, that uh, the best way of showing the government could not perform was to sabotage it. And, the, and so he was not like this at all, a guy by the name of Jim Lightfoot from Iowa. And so he said, yes, you know, and I explained that all these things that we need to do I need to have this flexibility. And so I need to operate off my own profits. The US Mint is a profit-making enterprise for the US government. Our profits go directly into the general fund of the treasury. And I told him, you give me this flexibility and I'm gonna send a lot more money into uh, the general fund. Which, which means less, be, less government debt, right? Less borrowing. Exactly, right? yeah, I mean, it is. That's exactly right. The money from the United States Mint, part of it is exactly the same as tax revenue. And the other part of it, which gets to the trillion dollar coin, is very much like the issuance of interest-free loans, uh, bonds. So uh, the combination of that, you know, really was compelling to him. He carried the legislation. Not only, not only did we get completely off the appropriations process, but we also got, um, we were uh, the FAR, the federal procurement regulations were lifted from us. And so we took a document that was like this thick and turned it into a pamphlet <laughs> to, dis to describe to outsiders what our uh, acquisition process was. So once again, it's a story of more flexibility, more discretion. And, yes, and giving now, you I will, I will say this. Uh, later on, we went to OMB and asked for flexibility around the personnel rules. And we had, I had such a good relationship with our unions that I actually had the endorsement of our unions to lift the uh, personnel rules from us. And when my deputy director and I went in, we explained what we wanted to do uh, and you know, pointed to our success on um, 
on the procurement and on funding, he said, you don't understand. It's not failure, we fear, it's success. <laughs> and so we realized, okay, we're at that point of hitting the catch 22. And the concern was, and he said, we said, what does that mean? And he said, well, if you achieve this kind of flexibility, every other government agency is going to want it. And we, we said, our response was, well, if they earned it, why wouldn't you give it to them? Knowing that that is a very high bar to reach and not very many government agencies are gonna do that. One of the reasons why they won't do it is because of the professional risk and therefore the financial risk that leadership in Washington DC takes if it really wants to make a significant change in how things work in mm -hmm. Washington and in the performance of an agency. So there were a lot of things that sort of came, and we got really lucky. We had friendly Republicans and mm -hmm. key positions. Um, so, but it is, yeah, it's hard to get that kind of flexibility. It's just incredible to hear this story in detail like this. I mean, I feel like there needs to be a book or a movie or something, but um, I, I spent a fair bit of time studying the origins of the Federal Reserve, and it's incredible to hear this story that you sort of almost did single-handedly when you think about the Federal Reserve's origins as this sort of massive confluence of banking interests in the heart of a crisis, and you're just behind the scenes, just quietly sort of doing something that ends up creating a level of, of budgetary and legal autonomy that's, that's sort of comparable within its own space. But a couple of things were sticking out to me. One is... Um, the, the, the Federal Reserve also has budgetary independence, but doesn't have the same kind of independence with its employees for maybe a similar reason. So there are court cases and things where they say, look, on one, in one sense, the Federal Reserve system is clearly a government agency, but it's got you know, its own separate budget process. But in certain circumstances, employees will be considered government employees. Um, but your point about the signage revenue being a, a source of income similar to interest-free uh, free loans, at the Fed, of course, they create Federal Reserve notes, they create reserves, which, which banks use as money, and the, the, the profits that the Fed returns from the assets that it buys by creating those, those dollars, um, when it returns it to the Fed, at least until very recently, it was booked in accounting terms as interest on the Federal Reserve notes. Uh -huh. So the whole thing was we can create this one kind of currency and anything we do within our agency will be sent back as as the sort of signage profit or the charge that we pay on, on, on the, 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 what we earn on creating these instruments. Um, and so it seems, it's sort of interesting to me that we, we have this moment where, you know, when the Federal Reserve returns $80 billion a year in, mm -hmm. in this revenue, we say, this is great. This re you know, reduces the need to borrow. Thank you so much. This isn't against Federal Reserve independence. This is good for, federal, you know, for, for, for yeah. statutory agency independence. Um, but, nobody kind of notices that the Mint's also been doing that often because the numbers are maybe an order of magnitude smaller. But as you noted, in your, in your tenure, they went up and they could have kept going up. And there's never, been, there's never been a limit historically on the upper limit. It's only been a sort of how visionary the Mint director is, essentially, it seems like. Yes. Um, yeah, th those are good points. And it gets to one of the points I like to make is... The trillion dollar coin is nothing novel. I mean, it is, it is, it has been made to out to be this gimmick. And as you say, uh, you know, it's everyday occurrence at the Fed and at the United States Mint. Uh, turn, you know, creating seniorage, um, seniorage being the difference between the face value of a coin in this case and the cost of production. And that represents sort of a profit, but represents more of a loan in this case, because the US Mint sends a coin, a quarter, let's say, to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve purchases it for the face value, 25 cents. Let's say the Mint produces it at a cost of eight cents. So that's 17 cents margin that the mint makes on that coin. Well, you add up all of that in the course of the year, and that is 
that acts as the U.S. Mint moves it over to the Treasury Department, and that acts, seniorage acts as a means of funding the government, just like a bond does. Um, and so the only difference a, a you know, trillion dollar coin represents is it has more zeros on the end of it. And yeah, that's a huge thing, but it's not a different process. It's not a different concept. In fact, this is a concept. Seniorage goes back, you know, I don't yeah, know. Founding, founding fathers, years. 20 hats, 20 hats <laughs> yeah. and tin whistles and, you know, the HBO miniseries. It's, it's as American yeah. as apple pie. That's <laughs> yes. it, so. hey, yeah, yeah. And it's because governments have used seniorage as to fund their operations, the king's operations for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And mint directors in the past, if they shaved too much, if they shorted the amount of metal was in a, that was in a coin beyond what the crown had authorized, they were hung. <laughs> you know, they, it was a big deal. A yeah, yeah. It was a really big deal. Isaac Newton was the mint director in the UK, took his job very seriously. Yeah, I mean, and and one two things on that. One is, you know, we the you say it's sort of like issuing government debt, but it's important, and this is where again the sort of being very clear about statutory language as a law professor, I love this whole moment because it's forcing people to learn how statutes work. Yes. But um, the, uh, the 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 public debt limit is quite narrow. It, it is mm -hmm. for things that have interest and principle. And it includes only a certain group of instruments. So, for example, uh, Federal Reserve notes and coins have never been included in the count of the national debt. If they did, mm -hmm. then we would probably have accidentally violated the debt ceiling a number of times already. Yes. Um, but not only that, there's actually been instruments that, for example, the Federal Reserve issues um, interest earning term deposits, which they started issuing in 2009, that pay interest are a legal obligation of the government, but are not included in the debt ceiling. And so there's a lot of instruments out there, including the greenbacks that Lincoln authorized that are still legal on the books at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing that are not included in the debt ceiling. We could call them debt. We could call them a means of financing, but they are not debt subject to limit in the yeah. same way. Yeah. Uh -huh. And this coin would be very clearly in that category, not in the category of, of debt subject to the debt ceiling, because that's a very narrow uh, category. And that's sort of one of the other confusions. People say, oh, well, this is basically violating the spirit of the debt ceiling. Well, no more than issuing a coin, a quarter is, right? Yes. It's, yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned, you know, that this was a sort of bullion coin program initially. And, and I think this is one other confusion. We were just talking about this earlier. People often think, well, bullion coins have to represent the, you know, the underlying metal value and nothing more. And the reality, correct me if I'm wrong, is that a lot of bullion coins are sold, you know, over their face value because the metal's more expensive. But there's nothing that says that the face value couldn't be more than the metal. And we certainly aren't on a gold standard or a metal standard in general. And it's the it's the face value of the coin that matters. In fact, I think I was pulled up a couple of statutes: the 31 USSC uh, USC 51112Q4, uh, which concerns the sale of $50 denominated gold bullion coins, says that the bullion coins shall be sold for an amount the secretary determines to be appropriate, but not less than the sum of the market value of the bullion and the cost of designing the coins, including labor, materials, machinery, et cetera. So in, even with, with regular bullion coins, and there's another one for uh, section 511204A, which governs the sale of $10 denominated commemorative gold coins, uh, that says that the bullion coin shall be sold at a price that's equal to or greater than the sum of the face value and the cost of designing the coins. So even when we think of bullion coins, we're not thinking of something that can only ever be the, the value of the metal. That might be a flaw, but it's not necessarily a, a ceiling. Is that, does that sound correct to you? Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, and it's only by practice and sort of practicality that the U.S. Mint sells bullion coins at a small premium over the spot price of gold that represents those costs of production and marketing and sales and all that. And that's because the 
purpose of the coin is to compete in marketplace That's with right. other bullion coins. And, um, and so those sorts of price constraints apply because of the intent and the intent of the product and the circumstances in which the product enters the marketplace. None of that applies to a trillion dollar coin. Its purpose is very different. And so it doesn't, it wouldn't make sense for it to follow that model because it is so different. The other thing that's important is there is no language in that, in that provision of law that authorizes the platinum coin that says anything about pricing. That's right. It, other, than, other than that the treasury secretary has absolute discretion, right? Yes, yes. So the restraints that are in the statute that apply to gold and silver um, bullion coins aren't there for platinum. And I believe it was Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe that talked about this. He said, you know, if you look at all the other statutes and they have constraints, and then you look at one that doesn't, and it was intentionally written to not have the same constraints as the others, then that's, you have to take that seriously as a matter of statutory interpretation. You can't say, oh, they meant it to have similar constraints. They just forgot. You wrote it. You didn't forget. You made yeah, it. No. Yeah, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. exactly right. And, and you mentioned also, um, you know, th th there was also this other language for proof coins in the, in the statute as well. And there's been some sort of debate around this. People say, well, proof coins uh, means they have to be only entered into uh, as collectibles. And obviously most proof coins are collectibles, but my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the word proof there refers to the method of production. Can you describe that for people that aren't very familiar with you know, the minting process, what proof yeah. is? So proof coins are produced in a very different way from circulating coins or bullion coins, and they are produced to a much higher standard. Mm -hmm. Also, they look different. They have a frosted image, typically, and a mirrored background. They are sort of the fine art of coin production. And so those coins are typically sold uh, to collectors. And, but there's no restriction. Uh, they could be sold as bullion coins. They could be sold, they could be produced and put into the Fed as circulating coins. So you wouldn't do it because it would be a waste of money and high production grade, but you could if you exactly. wanted to, right? Exactly. I mean, you could you could do it, and we've actually we actually talked about doing something like this to put a very small portion of like a stake quarter into circulation through these huge ballistic bags that we send to the Federal Reserve and they put into rolls, they ship to banks. And we decided there was enough interest in the 50 state quarters when we launched it without doing something like that. It, it was like, like Charlie, Charlie in the chocolate factory with the golden ticket. Huh? Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. And so, yes, we completely had the authority to do it. The economics of it, well, do not, does not work if you are doing all the coins like that. If you took a very small, you know, percentage and did it like that, then the accelerant would p easily pay for itself because all these other coins would be collected, hoping to get those, mm. and and you get all the seniorage profit on that. In fact, I believe it was Andrew Jackson that issued a Gobrek dollar that was a proof circulating coin. And I, I, you might know the history better than me, but my understanding is that it was the sort of reintroduction of, of, of a dollar coin. And so it was a sort of, as you say, an attempt to kind of drum up interest and to make a big show of it. And so the reason yeah. that you use this higher production grade quality was precisely to get the the marketing and the attention and more than you might for a regular coin. And that was a proof coin that happened to circulate. So there's no kind of inconsistency there. Yes, there's, there's a similar situation that as far as I know, was an accident. I was not aware it was happening. I don't at all know that it was intentional, but when the, when the Sacagawea coin was launched, there was, um, there were some of them that were produced on a more highly refined 
uh, blank. Mm -hmm. And those coins became especially valuable collector items once it, they were discovered. And Se semi proof, so, huh? Quasi proof. Yeah, it was, yeah, but the, it had a better strike to it. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we had the similar kind of effect that you're describing. And the, the idea of kind of having a high, you know, you call it the art of coins seems to be pretty appropriate for a trillion dollar coin. I mean, I've always said people say, what happens if it gets stolen or something? And it's sort of a funny <laughs> joke. And yeah, we all get to laugh about it. Yes. Of course, if you steal a trillion dollar coin and then try to use it, someone, there's going to be a pretty strong legal presumption you didn't get it legally, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but I've always thought, you know, it would be, it would be great to have some, some ritual and symbolism around this, especially if it was to save, you know, save the government from itself and this in insanity of the debt ceiling. Um, when you think about the Federal Reserve and, and its announcements, you know, the ritual of these Federal Reserve pronouncements, when you think of courts and them wearing robes, you know, when you think <laughs> of military service and, and the, you know, the music that they play and the folding of the flag, ritual is very important to our, our government. Um, and if we were going to mint a trillion dollar coin, having it to be beautiful quality and then, you know, put, having a child walk it from the mint to the, to the Fed and say, you know, yeah. here we are, I'd like to hand this over. And then I accept <laughs> this on behalf of the American people, you know, yes. um, and then maybe on the other side, it ends up in the Smithsonian and everybody can tour it in, in schools <laughs> as part of their, you know, American history education. It seems like proof coin there is, is sort of the appropriate one, even if the law had said bullion proof or circulating coins, if you were going to create a a trillion dollar coin, you probably want it to be proof. Yes, yes. Um, well, not only would you stand out if you carried a trillion dollar coin, tried to trade, <laughs> use it in commerce, but it's uh, hard to make change for too. That's right, so, that's right. Uh, so, but yeah, sitting at Smith, Smithsonian, you know, obviously you'd have to have it well guarded, but um, the alongside the Declaration the, of Independence or something. Like <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the key to this and to address another knock that we hear that is fallacious on the coin, um, the key is that the coin does not, and of course, cannot go into circulation. It has no impact whatsoever on the money supply. Hmm. And that is the wrap is that all of a sudden, it's gonna be like Venezuela. You know, yeah. all of a sudden you're increasing the money supply by a trillion dollars yeah. and you're gonna have all these disasters and consequences. No, you know, it never goes into commerce. It's not like other coins or currency or QE uh, for that matter, in which money is being, you know, inserted in the economy. This coin is produced in the United States Mint, goes to the Federal Reserve, stays in a vault, there will be when sanity prevails and the debt limit is increased, that trillion dollars coin can come back to the US Mint just like any other coin. That senior is just taken off the books and the coin is destroyed. All right, the only spending that would happen is the spending that Congress has already said needs to happen that should be yeah. happening anyway. And in fact, is constitutionally required under the 14th Amendment. The money going exactly. out of the Treasury's account into people's pockets should have kept going anyway, but for yeah. the insanity in Congress and these misunderstandings that the, the debt ceiling is supposed to stop us from being able to, to continue honoring those yes. obligations. Yeah, exactly. And I, so this one question you mentioned there, you said, you know, the, the coin doesn't need to go into circulation. Um, Usually, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that coins are sold to the Fed and then the Fed sells it on to banks who then, you know, get it out into the public. But the Fed isn't the only actor that can and, and has bought coins directly from the mint, you know, apart from collectors and bullion investors, right? There are other ways that coins do get into circulation. Do you, you want to tell us a little bit about some of that history? <laughs> hey, yes, it's sort of notorious. So um, we're given a mandate by Congress uh, to produce a new dollar coin to replace the Susan B. Anthony, which was an utter failure for a number of reasons. And so, and this is something that Congressman Castle and I worked on together as well. And we, had, we were given discretion in this case too, but only over the design of a coin. Mm -hmm. And 
it was through a design competition that the United States men executed that the image of Sacagawea and her infant Jean Baptiste on her back during uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition was chosen uh, for that coin. And so when we were, and we did a lot of market research, part of the entrepreneurial basis, United States men hadn't done that apart, uh, before to any significant degree, certainly hadn't with the Susan B. Anthony. And part of the market research was to go to the banks and the Fed and say, you know, to make a pitch, you should get this coin. It's gonna be much more popular than Susan B. Anthony. They won't be in the vaults forever. Here's the market research of consumers that shows there will be this demand. And the response from the banks and the Federal Reserve was, well, you have to demonstrate to us, actually demonstrate to us that there will be demand for this coin. Well, the ultimate catch 22, because if we can't get it through the Federal Reserve into the banks, how do you demonstrate that the public's gonna want it? It's almost like they so, just didn't want it. They didn't want it, yeah. The coins in the Federal Reserve, I mean, the banks in the Federal Reserve, they don't like coins. And for- It's an um, unpleasant reminder that there's other monetary traditions other than theirs, right? <laughs> yes, and coins are more expensive for the Federal Reserve. They're heavier, they're- They have to pay for, face value, not the paper cost if they buy paper exactly. notes. Yeah. Yes, and a dollar coin that was highly popular, the banks in particular didn't like. Because what happens if you have a really popular coin? Customers come into the bank. They ask for it. They come to the counter. They come to the drive-thru. That imposes a cost on the banks they don't want to incur. So no way. They weren't going to do it. We couldn't persuade them. It wasn't a big enough issue for the Secretary of the Treasury or certainly the Chairman of the Fed. Didn't Small change for them. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Doesn't matter. Penny Annie. Yeah. And so, in fact, I believe I've read some government accountability office reports saying, you know, it would be much better for costs and things to have less dollar paper notes and more dollar coins, but yes. it's very hard to get people to use it. And it would certainly be hard if the banks are not actually on board with helping people use it and, and actively resist. Yes. yes. So being entrepreneurial, <laughs> we decided we'd go around the Fed and the banks and I had a lunch with the brand new lobbyist for Walmart who had never done any lobbying before. He didn't know this kind of entrepreneurial stuff wasn't smart in Washington, DC. And so I said, what I wanna do is I wanna launch this coin on the same day in 3000 locations, Walmart locations across the country. And we will direct ship you know, and it was, my recollection was, it was 200 million coins over the period of those two months to all those locations. And a huge number, they wanted, uh, you know, as much as we would could produce, or we couldn't produce more than that. And so none of the banks ordered it, Walmart ordered it, and we did a marketing campaign and at the end, near the end of January, 2000, that coin was launched. People lined up. People think the Susan B., uh, that the second Julia coin was a failure. And it ended up being a failure for a couple of reasons. One is hostility in the banks and the Federal Reserve. But when we launched it, people lined up at the stores, they, were out of the coins by the end of the first day. They wanted to order more. We are on a production schedule. But when people, you know, couldn't get the coin that they wanted at Walmart, they went to their banks and the banks didn't have them. And so they were embarrassed. And so what do they do? They don't say, oh, you know, we made a mistake. They call their contact at the Federal Reserve. And the complaints all come in to Greenspan. Greenspan calls the Secretary of Treasury. I get a telephone call and I explained why we had done it this way and it faded the heat. But what we ended up doing 
was we went back to Walmart and said, we're not going to be able to provide you the second 100 million coins. We're going to, and it's a government contract. And also they had achieved their objective. So mm -hmm. we took that 100 million coins and direct shipped, it, shipped them to the banks based on orders they made online. On the day. And, huh? On the day. And, yes. Yeah. And they, um, and we sh direct shipped it because the process of getting coins from the mint through the Federal Reserve to the banks, it was so slow that we, you know, it frustrated the demand. So we, you know, bit the bullet and direct shipped it to them. And so it kind of ended the controversy. It's an interesting story on two levels, because on one level, it's showing that, you know, people often say, oh, well, the Fed wouldn't accept the coin. Well, maybe there are other people that would accept, maybe not a trillion, you know, not everybody's looking for a trillion in cash, but there are certain investors and things that are looking for, you know, a billion dollars in, in, in liquid cash and things that if you could say, hey, you know, we can't sell any more T-bills this month, but we can sell some coins that you can store and, and they're legal tender and they will satisfy your you know, fiduciary responsibilities to invest in safe assets. You know, I think there could be people who'd be interested. But the other part of that story is that, you know, we often think, oh, the Fed said it can't be done, so it can't be done. But the reality is that's just one opinion of one agency within the government. And there's other agencies with other opinions. And who ends up winning that battle and when, when there's a difference is often about who's more creative in putting pressure in the right way. And the story you just told is about precisely putting pressure. And I, you mentioned a similar story in the past about the 50 state quarters where the antagonist was the treasury in that situation. If you want to share a little bit about that story. Mm -hmm. Well, the um, opinions are a dime a dozen. And so, of course, you have to look behind the opinions at the facts and on all these monetary issues. They're very complex. So it's hard to sort through. And usually you have to rely on somebody whose judgment and independence you trust. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that's crucial to look at what is the motive behind mm -hmm. the economic motive, the emotional motive, whatever. The partisan, the political the power motive, motive yeah. behind an opinion. And also, what is the strategic situation? Mm -hmm. For example, we are hearing from the Treasury Department and the White House that no, no, we won't do the dollar coin. It's again, I mean, the trillion dollar coin. It's a gimmick. Well, okay, that may be a sincere expression of their intent or their adamant commitment not to do it. But also, it's very clear the White House and the Treasury Department wanted a particular outcome, which they got by standing firm and to say, yeah, well, you know, the trillion dollar coin is an option releases the pressure, the negotiating pressure to get the outcome they really wanted. And it was Margaret Thatcher that famously popularized, there is no alternative as a justification yes. for doing anything. And often there was, but it was a yes. useful line. In fact, I actually remember speaking to some senior treasury officials back about the situation in 2011. And they said that, they said, we didn't want there to be another option because yes. we wanted to force the Republicans to come to the table. And so anything yeah. that showed that this could be resolved on our side yeah. was inconvenient for us. Yes. And it's easy to frame that in partisan terms. That, okay, the Democrats were smarter, tougher, stood hard this time as opposed to last time they prevailed. But it's crucial to rise above that partisan, you know, it's really a partisan dismissal of what's really at stake. That's what's right. at stake here is using the debt limit as a cudgel by threatening the country with default. And now it's happened three times. The first two times, the Democrats compromised. They were you know, the responsible party. And what did that do? That just yeah. laid the foundation for the next time that, yeah. you know, that their opponents would push them to the wall. And this time they took a stand and they prevailed. And, and you know, Mitch McConnell managed to get, what, 10 senators or something on board with this uh, or to, to vote to change the rules to suspend, uh, extend it for another two months. 
But Very all need, difficult. All you Very need is hard. a slightly more radical, you know, opposition party or, or uh, maybe not three branches where there's enough, you know, members on one side or the other. And yeah, I, I've described it as, as the, the putting a gun to the head of the American economy and saying we'll yes. pull the trigger if they yeah. don't come to the table. And, yeah. you know, even if they're being unreasonable by not coming to the table, the fact that you're putting a gun to the head of the American economy is its own form of kind of degradation of the, the, the process and what the public understands because you're telling them something that isn't true to achieve yeah. an outcome. And in yeah. doing so, eroding that trust in, the, in, in government and in the fact that you're, you can, you're, your politicians are telling you what's actually going on. And they're doing so in a way that's playing with fire that if it gets burnt, will will affect everybody. And we yes. will all go, I can't believe this happened, you know? Yes, yeah. And in, I think in the past, um, when it came up in 2011, 2013, this became increasingly difficult to believe uh, that, but I mean, there are some who believed and some very smart people, savvy people who believed that, um, this was only traditional politics, using leverage to, in a negotiating situation, to get an advantage over your opponents. I think we've increasingly come to realize, not just because of previous debt limit fights, but from other political situations, that there are people in the country who believe that they benefit in terms of power and political position by uh, damaging the economy of the country when the opposing party will be held accountable for it. And it's a form of economic sabotage. And there is still a group of people who would benefit from that and uh, or who could sustain their position for a period of time in those circumstances but the vast majority of us would be losers and we saw that almost with some of the some of the people motivated behind brexit for example That's they right. might have been quite aware of how damaging it could be to that economy but they didn't care yes. um so um, i don't know if you don't want to talk about the, the 50 state quarter program and the treasury experience there if you if we can move on on that one but uh the other thing um, was, you know, we, people have been saying, well, the Fed could just refuse to accept the coin and it wouldn't be booked as legal tender until it was sold. And so it'd have to be sold to someone first. And, and if the Fed refused to accept it, then uh, that would be that. Um, and and you, were, you were telling me earlier about sort of the, the, the difference in the, the legal rules around when something gets counted as, you know, legal tender, where it leaves the, yeah, <laughs> leaves yeah. the mint versus when it gets to the Fed. And yes. uh, it reminded me a little bit of when I teach in contracts, you know, people talk about the, the, the mailbox rule, you know, when, when you accept a contract mm -hmm. and you send it in the mail versus when the other person receives it, it's a question mm -hmm. of kind of when was it accepted? Mm -hmm. um, but can you tell us a little bit about that, that, that rule and, and how it's changed and sort of what you think about it? You bet. Uh, first of all, I think pra this is a highly unlikely theoretical scenario. Where the Federal Reserve would have to be refusing yeah. to go along with the Treasury and saying we prefer default in this 11th hour moment. And yeah. we will be the ones putting our hand up saying yes. we're going to we're willing to cause this default <laughs> yes. in the name of Federal Reserve independence, which, by the way, we hope will still be around tomorrow if we do this. <laughs> yes, yes. That's one half of the equation that makes it virtually impossible to happen. The other half of it is that just politically, the president and the secretary of treasury and the chairman of the Federal Reserve are gonna have to agree on doing this beforehand. It's just, it's inconceivable that the White House would try to jam this into the Fed. Um, but, I mean, there are scenarios that you can conjure up where something like that might happen. So, I had a colleague actually remind me that it's still on the books that the president can remove the, the Fed chair for cause. And maybe yes. this would be that moment, that unthinkable yes. moment where you might actually be able to remove a Fed chairman for cause because they're standing in the way of preventing unconstitutional default. <laughs> yes, I definitely think that as would far as states gone. go, you would hope yeah, that that's, that would be that's high enough. If the president said, "It's my sincere belief 
that oh. this this Fred chair is standing in the way of us, you know, preventing default. I can't imagine the Supreme Court's getting in the in the middle of that and reversing it. So you know, anyway. yes, uh, yes, and I can think of at least three members of the Senate who you could move into the chairmanship of the Federal Reserve that would accept a trillion dollar coin that fast for. I won't ask you to name their names right now. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not going to name them. (laughs) But they, uh, and not just because it avoids default, but there are a whole set of other policy issues that come together in the trillion dollar coin that people don't talk about because they're complex and very complex. And they are downstream from what we're talking about here today. So, um, this a caveat here to answer your question. Um, this is my recollection of what happened 20 plus years ago at the United States Mint and why it happened. And I do not know whether it's changed since then or not. I'd be very surprised if it changed because of the reason why it changed. So during my term and before my term, during most of my term, uh, seniorage was booked when coins left the mint loading dock on its way to the Fed. And so in the case of a trillion dollar coin, we, you know, the US mint strikes it, they send it to the loading dock, a truck takes it over to a helicopter, which flies it over to the Federal Reserve in New York City. You know an hour. Uh, So under that scenario, boom, the seniorage would be, you know, uh, would be booked uh, immediately. Uh, There was a point late in my term when it was the OMB, Office of Management and Budget, I believe, could have been Treasury, but I think it was OMB that changed that booking procedure and change it so that the uh, seniorage wasn't booked until the Fed had accepted the coin and a quarter, whatever coin. And the reason, and it might've happened during the 50 state quarters program, uh, that would make sense, which was launched in 1999 because we were shipping so many coins to the Federal Reserve that OMB looked at that and said, oh, we need to change the incentives for the shipment of coins to the Federal Reserve. Being too successful, you're getting too many out the door. Well, it was just the concern that sometime in the future, the US Mint would produce a whole bunch of coins, send them over to the Federal Reserve or the administration would order it to happen. And then an inappropriately book, inappropriately (laughs) book, uh, all the seniorage. So, and this is ironic because when I got to, there was this boom and bust cycle of uh, the production of coins. And the, as you can imagine, the demand in the real world for coinage depends on the economic activity uh, in the economy. More coins are, need, are needed when there's more economic activity. We, we had a coin shortage last year. I think it's still enduring exactly. because of the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. And so there, and this was magnified by the uh, Fed's terrible model for projecting coin demand. And so I had a very smart young economist who I brought in and said, oh, we got to fix this because what happens is we fall way behind in production when all of a sudden all this demand comes in. And then so we're so slow in cutting off production, the Federal Reserve vaults fill up with coins. Then those back up into the, we had them <laughs> not in vaults, but in hallways <laughs> uh, back in those days. And then when demand comes back up, all that flows out, we have to crank up you know, production. So we began, so the irony of this is that we were responsible for changing the model that the Fed used uh, and cutting down this shipment of excess coins and seniorage and everything. 
But so that change occurred and that would obviously affect the uh, trillion dollar coin because if the Fed re refused to accept it, then uh, the seniorage wouldn't be booked. Um, but as we are saying, that's a highly unlikely situation for all kinds of reasons. It, you know, it would only be done in uh, as a fail-safe safe measure. And, and, and the rule that the OMB set could just be changed again. Right? Well, that's the other thing. Uh, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's not legislative. It's not statutory. It wasn't congressional intent. This is all within the executive branch. This is all internal baseball between different agencies and internal policy. Yeah. Was not it wasn't even a regulatory rule change, right? So it wouldn't even need to go through public the notice and yeah. all that stuff. It was just, you know, their decision. So, so if Biden need to change that rule five minutes before the coin got struck, <laughs> it could potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I know we've been going and we're end of time. I've got one last question. Sort of, you know, you mentioned these downstream second order implications of the coin. Um, one of the things I was writing and found this, you know, whole issue so fascinating is because I was, you know, as an elementary school teacher, I like social myths and public narratives about how our government works that provide the basis for us to understand the world we live in that are accessible to people. A colleague of mine, a sociologist named Jakob Feinig, talks about this term monetary silence, where average people are taught to, that, you know, you don't need to know about this stuff. It's very complicated. There's people in the room you know, who wear suits, who have finance backgrounds, they understand all of this stuff. You shouldn't try to understand it. Yes. Or, you know, we need economic literacy and monetary financial literacy in schools. But what we really mean is, you know, you should balance your checkbook. You shouldn't learn how the government actually works and how the, the sort of veil of money works. Um, and even, you know, very, very respected and scholars who I otherwise respect, you know, uh, there was an op-ed in the New York Times by Peter Coy just recently about this. Um, they would say, look, you know, yes, it's a noble lie that we can't make money out of thin air and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, even if noble lies aren't great in some situations, we shouldn't probably be drawing attention to this too much right now. And at least to me, if you look at the alternative, it's, it's this ca catastrophic debt ceiling that we keep coming back at. It's cut politicians saying we can't afford to deal with climate change. We can't afford to deal with poverty because we don't have enough money. And as you said before, it's a useful political kind of rhetoric to say, oh, there's no alternative to austerity. There's no alternative. But if there is an alternative, then these myths are not just things that keep the lights on. They're actually things that actively harm us. And maybe we could be looking to a new set of myths, something that fits our new moment and our new needs. And if we're in a world now where, you know, Bitcoin and Dogcoin and all these things, people people have embraced the idea that you can coin an asset out of thin air. It could be literally made of zeros and ones on a computer. Yeah. And the value is how people accept it, how people use it, what's backing it. Is it got the force of law behind it, et cetera. That if we think about coins, there's actually maybe a, a time for renaissance of coins as a sort of symbol of the money power and going yeah. back to that 200 year history. And um, one last little point on that before I just forget your thoughts is, um, I know that we're in now this world of government digital currencies we've been talking about, you know, and they say a central bank digital currency. And I've yeah. testified to Congress saying, why don't we talk about coinage? Why don't we talk about digital coinage? Because if you think about a bank account, there's a third party in the middle. There's not as much privacy. In fact, there's a whole third party political legal doctrine that says you don't have privacy if you put your money with the bank. Um, but even, even paper currency has a barcode. Coins are the original anonymous mm. money. If it's in your pocket, it's yours. And one of the earliest forms of digital currency that was in, uh, uh, tested by a government was Canada, and it was the Royal Mint. They created the Mint Chip Program, and it was yeah. an attempt to create a digital yeah. coin. So maybe, you know, I'd be curious your thoughts as we're entering into this digital world, as we're re-discussing how to build a whole new form of currency, that maybe the mint should be in the room. Maybe we should be thinking about this beyond just the Federal Reserve, beyond just a better bank account and what lessons we can learn from the history of coinage and from the design of coinage, even if it will be a digital you know, equivalent. Well, um, Mike Castle, Representative Mike Castle back in probably 96, 97, had a congressional hearing on the future of money. And I testified at that. And 
all these issues sort of came up in a uh, primitive form. You were talking about stored value cards at the time, if I remember that. Yes, that, yeah, that's exactly right. Stored value coins, and this is one of the one of the things that I was you raised. One of the issues I was really intent on at the time was that coinage is the ultimate private exchange, cannot be traced, and that in those days people weren't concerned about privacy. I mean, it was amazing to me how nonchalant people were about privacy. And then we saw all that take off with social media, where people told their life stories and said things online that inevitably would come back to haunt them. And people just didn't, didn't care about it. Well, now, especially with after 9-11 and the surveillance. The Patriot Act. Yeah. yeah, Patriot Act. People woke up to what that meant. And so, you know, and it's begun to sink into the culture. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, coinage is the physical embodiment of that set of privacy values, which are being expressed in what I believe is a highly dangerous to individuals form in, um, in uh, you know uh, crypt uh, uh, crypt currency, and um, and also you know has the potential of destabilizing the larger economic uh, system. If, if so, the only but, kind of privacy we get is these is these volatile crypto private currencies, then yeah. it will be a very bad day for privacy because well, it doesn't we, have the full faith and credit of the United States. It doesn't have that whole infrastructure. You can't use it at a store necessarily, those kinds of things. Well, we've lived through that before too, leading into the Civil War, when before there was the American the Greenback. Greenback. Yeah. And so we, you had all these banks issuing their own currency. And yeah, you know, if you were using it locally, you knew something about the stability and reputation of that bank, but the further you got away from that bank, that note would still be used and people didn't know, well, you know, what is the provenance behind this note? And- I remember US someone saying that it's often better to get a counterfeit note on a good bank than a, a <laughs> yes. real note on a bad bank. <laughs> exactly right, yes. And the US could put up with that um, economically, and there wasn't the pol political will to do anything about it until the Civil War. And then the U.S., the federal government, number one, had the ability to do it because half the nation who opposed doing anything about that left Congress, and the other was, we need to finance, you know, the war. So it necessity bred a change. And Unfortunately, that's how the government works. Our government works, it reacts. So there will have to be some kind of disaster that occurs around cryptocurrency that will drive Congress and the Federal Reserve, the regulators to do something about it. Hopefully that occurs somewhere else, not in the US and we learn the lesson from somebody else. But let me address the, the assumption that underlies this question. And that is that people don't really understand fiat currency. I think that may have been true in the past, probably was true in the past, but people have, have driven into their minds over and over again, certainly since 2009 with mm -hmm. the QE and the, you know, and, and the opening, <laughs> basically the flood of money supply into the economy uh, to save the economy, not just the US economy, but the world economy, people came to understand that fiat, what fiat currency means. And they don't, they don't necessarily understand what it means, the full faith and credit of the United States government, what that means. Uh, but in, especially when you know, you're threatening to default on your, you yeah. know. Especially when it doesn't mean as much as it used to. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think people are getting that. The other thing, a reason why people are being educated on that is that 
a conservative mantra has been against fiat currency for the gold standard. And, you know, and that's been the case since, you know, 33, since FDR got us off the gold standard and well, informally, and then Nixon yeah. took us off. Yeah. But so I think um, the predicate has been laid for trillion dollar coin. People just don't, but it, it looks like a gimmick. And when you think about it, this is a branding problem. Yeah. Because QE, quantitative easing, does n- it hides what it does. That, those words, and sounds really complex beyond our comprehension. When, well, a trillion dollar coin sounds ludicrous. You know? yeah. What and, we're doing is we're easing quantitatively with a yeah. trillion dollar coin. Let's just- Yes, uh, yes. yeah. Mint quantitative easing, yeah. No, and you're, you're absolutely right. You know, there were newspaper headlines, oh, trillions of dollars have been created. If that was going to cause a panic in the streets, where was it? Where's the last 10 years? When the last yeah. debt ceiling crisis happened, even Standard & Poor's downgraded the US credit rating. And what happened? People flooded into treasuries, not yes. at them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I remember Neil Kashkari last year, uh, the president of Minneapolis Fed said, we have an infinite amount of dollars that we can use to save us from this crisis. And I'd yeah. never heard a Federal Reserve person use that. <laughs> no, that is infinite in public before, maybe in private, yes. but not in public. Yeah. Yeah. And the New York Times had an op-ed headline saying that the, the coronavirus money is being pulled out of thin air. And if that's not going to cause a crisis, you know, I think we, you're right. This idea that the public can't handle this truth, that it's too big, it's too scary. Yeah. Yeah. Even if that had some credibility in 2006, it doesn't have the same credibility in 2021. Okay. And but maybe you're right. Maybe it it does take necessity to breed government yeah. action, and maybe they need you know maybe we do need to get even closer to that debt ceiling cliff if you know yeah. before we will entertain uh, the unthinkable. If I could, if, Sorry, if I could make one other point that uh, has really been impressing on me. Uh, under these current circumstances. Um, There will come a day when it's inevitable. What goes down must also go up. (laughs) And I'm talking about the inflation rate. And we all know this in the back of our minds that once the inflation rate goes up and the federal government is no longer paying what is essentially zero interest on a on you know an inflation adjusted basis for you know, on its bonds, when inflation goes up and we have to pay more, uh, and we have thirty trillion dollars in debt, then we're going to see interest payments, the financing of that debt, devouring larger and larger sections of the federal uh, the federal budget. Yeah. And, um, and coinage and seniorage is one of the ways conceptually to think about how to deal with that. Mm-hmm. And this is particularly relevant in terms of the whole starve the beast mm-hmm. uh, strategy yeah. is that we will build all these deficits at some point the government will face reality and we'll have to start cutting social security and killing all the old new deal and, and, um, and great society programs and Obamacare now, all that will have to die. And, uh, and there won't be any choice. Well, there are choices. And, um, and we just need to be aware that that day is gonna come. And we need to be preparing preemptively to do that marketing work and do yes. that public education and building the institutions. And I know I speak to people and they say, well, you know, even if the, even if the treasury issued zero interest financing, the Fed would pay interest on reserves if it wanted to raise the interest rate. So it, it doesn't matter which way. And I say to them, but you know, it's very different in the public mindset if this is the cost of borrowing or the cost of government spending on one hand, or if it's the Federal Reserve choosing to pay money for free to yes. people because it wants a higher interest rate. If the Fed wants to do that, if it wants to take responsibility for paying you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of interest as part of its monetary policy, it can take responsibility for doing that and see whether or not that's the best way to actually 
limit inflation. There were debates in the 70s and the 50s about using other forms of qualitative and quantitative credit regulation and other ways to limit, you know, investment in the economy to cool the economy down that didn't require raising interest rates through the roof like Paul Volcker did. And yeah. my guess is when it's easy to blame the treasury for those interest payments, then the Fed, is, it's a lot easier for the Fed to raise rates. If the Fed yeah. had to own the politi <laughs> politics of raising rates like that and giving free money to interest earning, you know, people who hold interest earning uh, reserves or other assets issued by the Fed um, and had to take responsibility for that on their balance sheet, my guess is they would be a little bit more creative about mm -hmm. finding other ways to manage inflation. In that yes, yeah. yes. Well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure, Director Deal. I, I honestly, I feel like this is the kind of conversation that will you know, hopefully go into the history books because I've never heard these kinds of stories from within the government before. So thank you so much for taking the time with me and for your voice and for your courage in speaking out. And I hope, hope I don't have to see you again because we don't have this problem recurring. <laughs> yes. I'm, yes. I'm not, you know, maybe we will. And I, I look forward to, to connecting again in the future. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.